What's the deal with MOSFET amplifiers? You may have seen a Marshall guitar amplifier that on the front panel says it's a MOSFET amplifier. Or maybe you're looking at some vintage audio equipment and it's labeled that this is a MOSFET amplifier or somebody says, you know, that's a MOSFET amplifier stage in that. And this is a selling feature. And so what's so great about MOSFETs and where do MOSFETs fit in the audio amplifier scope of history? I see that there's a lot of YouTube videos out there that talk about MOSFET amplifiers and they get into the nitty gritty of electronic circuit design as to how to design a proper amplifier using MOSFET transistors. And that's not this video. This is more aimed at those who are interested in audio and questioning what advantage does a MOSFET amplifier offer, if any. And how come we don't see them too often anymore if they were so great? So a MOSFET is just simply a specialized kind of transistor, a newfangled kind of transistor. And to understand the problems that they solve, let's take a little step back in audio history and talk about where we came from and the problems that we were struggling with and how MOSFETs address that issue. So back in the 50s or the 60s, we were using tube type equipment, you know, vacuum tubes and output transformers and high voltage electronics. And by the end of the 60s, we had gotten pretty good at building those kind of amplifiers. But transistors came along and they were taking the world by storm and everybody was moving over to transistorized designs. And of course, transistors offered a number of compelling advantages. So through the late 60s and into the 70s, we were trying to figure out how to build good sounding amplifiers using transistors. And that's a little bit challenging because transistors have some behavioral characteristics that make them less than perfect amplifiers just out of the box. Transistors can be thought of somewhat like water valves, where you have a control which doesn't take a whole lot of force to operate, and by using that control you can con Control the amount of water flow that goes through the valve. And that's sort of like how a transistor is. There's three leads on a transistor and you could think of it as input, output, and control. But unlike a water valve with a transistor, what would happen is if it was turned off, nothing would flow through it. But then as you turn it on, well still nothing happens for a while. And as you turn it up, 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 suddenly, boom, the transistor turns on and a trickle of flow passes through it. And then from that point, you can turn it up and control that flow nice and linearly, more or less. And then likewise, as you turn it down, you can go from a really strong torrent of flow down to a softer and softer, more mild flow. But then at a certain point, as you continue turning it down, it just doo, shuts off. So you can't just control a little teeny tiny dribble coming through it. So the designers had to work with this characteristic and figure out how to build amplifiers that had smooth linear control all the way from zero to maximum. And they did a pretty good job of this. The other challenge that designers had when working with transistor amplifiers is that transistors have positive temperature coefficient, meaning that the transistor likes to turn itself on more and more when it's hot. And by turning itself on more, it gets hotter. And so when the transistors are cool, they operate pretty easily and controllably. But as they get hotter and hotter and they start reaching their maximum temperature, they just naturally want to turn on more, which of course would increase the temperature even more. And you can get into this thermal runaway feedback loop where a hot transistor can just zip itself up into maximum power and blow itself up. Unfortunately, when that happens, it can also uh, take out the other transistor that it's attached to and other components nearby that it's attached to. And so sometimes when uh, these amplifiers would have these thermal runaway failures, one transistor would fail and then quickly 
take out the whole bank of transistors and a bunch of other parts, and it can uh, result in rather expensive and spectacular failure. And there were some amplifiers of the day that were known for being good-sounding amplifiers that had some reliability problems. Uh, for example, the um, phase linear amplifiers were sometimes nicknamed flame linear for some of the spectacular failures that had occurred occasionally. And so this is a real issue that designers are wrestling with. And so how do you keep the transistors from just running away thermally and blowing up? Well, you can use enough heat sink and enough transistors and maybe put a fan on the amplifier to keep it cool enough so that under any reasonable circumstances, you'll never get the transistors hot enough to reach that condition. Okay. You could also put temperature sensors into the amplifier to actually sense what the transistor temperature is and make adjustments to the operating conditions of the amplifier. And they might sense other things like current flow at certain locations and factor that in. Some of the circuitry for self-protection became pretty complicated. And can you put all of this self-protection circuitry into the amplifier that's adjusting the amplifier's behavior without impacting the sound quality of the amplifier? That's a challenge. Well, around 1980, MOSFETs came onto the scene. The transistor manufacturer released these new parts, MOSFETs. And they were a new twist on an old part because we had FETs. FETs were well known. And these were small signal transistors that were made of a different composition than standard transistors. And so they behaved a little differently. Now, there's still transistors. They still do the transistor thing. But with a FET, they required very, very little energy to drive the control signal. So you could think of that big water valve with a round like steering wheel on it that you had to crank open or crank closed. So it wouldn't take a whole lot of force to open or close that valve, but you had to put a little muscle into it to get it moving. But with that, you could control a real massive amount of water flow. So if that was a regular transistor, a FET would be the same valve but the FET would have a feather touch control on it. So you could just touch that control and it would open or close the valve without requiring hardly any force in your part. So that makes that FETs could be like really sensitive transistors. And we used FETs for FET volt ohm meters for test equipment. So this would be a meter that could measure electricity, but it would do so without putting any load on what you're measuring. And so you could just poke in there with your meter and measure active circuitry, and the active circuitry wouldn't even feel any load on it because it had a FET input. Okay, so we knew about FET transistors, but we haven't had FET transistors that could really switch massive amounts of power. The ones that we had currently worked with were just you know, signal amplifying transistors. Well, now we have power transistors that are based on this FET architecture. And they were interesting because... The FET transistors, just by their nature, tended to be really high-quality transistors that could switch fast and accurately, and so that would mean that they are very high-quality for audiophile applications, or one would presume, typically. And the other great thing about FETs was that they had a negative temperature coefficient, unlike a transistor that has a positive temperature coefficient. So that means that when the FETs got hot, they naturally wanted to just sort of automatically shut themselves down. And so they had no propensity for going into thermal runaway. If you drove a FET super hard, it would try to basically self-protect itself and start shutting down its gain. Now, of course, like any transistor, if you really abuse the part and try to drive way too much power through it into a ridiculous load you could damage the part. So sure, it is possible to overheat FETs. It's possible to blow them out like normal transistors. But their internal behavior is not to run away into um, thermal runaway conditions. And so that means that amplifier designers can use FETs, which naturally have really high performance and should make good amplifiers. And they don't need to incorporate all sorts of thermal protection circuitry because 
kind of built into the FET in its own operational behavior. So that means we could simplify a lot of this protection circuitry in the amplifier and still put out an amplifier that has superior protection abilities. And that would have less impact on the sound quality. And the FETs themselves, if you choose good ones, have superior sound quality right out of the box. And so that was a pretty compelling argument for using FETs. Um, FETs also have a bit of a hmm, softer sound quality to them when driven hard. So some people had thought that FETs had a distortion characteristic that made them sound, well, a little bit more or less like tube amplifiers. Now, my first amplifier when I was getting into hi-fi was a David Hafler 500 at DH500. It was a good amp. It was a MOSFET amplifier. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of people thought that uh, FETs had this kind of magical sound characteristic to it. I would say the amplifier sounded really good. It sounded clean and clear and transparent. Um, if you hit clipping, it wasn't too annoying. But... I'd also say that the sound quality difference between amplifiers, if the amplifiers are good, high-quality amplifiers, and they're driven within their abilities, you know, you're not trying to put them into a load that they really can't drive or into clipping, you know, within their normal operating range, they all should sound pretty darn identical. Um, I'd almost challenge people to be able to identify one amplifier versus another in a blind A-B test that was properly conducted. So I know that there's a bunch of audiophile types out there who think, oh, this amplifier has a much more refined sound versus this other one. Well, there are some bad products out there, but assuming that all the products you're comparing are really good, ah, it's really challenging to hear, actually hear the difference. So there's a bit of a mystique about MOSFET amplifiers, and people say, oh, these sound so good. Well... They do sound good, but do they really sound that much better than other amplifiers? I don't know that you could really tell the difference. And so what became of MOSFETs if they were so great? How come they didn't really um, take over the amplifier market long term? I would say a couple of things. Um, one is that designers learned how to make good amplifiers with standard transistors. Now, they might have needed a little more protection circuitry and so on, but as our designs evolved, we figured out how to make really good sounding amplifier with common transistors, and those parts are probably a little less expensive. So it might have just been a simple return on investment, cost-benefit analysis, said that we can make transistors that satisfy the customer demand and we can manufacture them a little bit less expensively than we can if we had used MOSFET output stages. And of course, MOSFETs and standard transistors, although they're all transistors, they require unique designs, depending on which direction you want to go. MOSFETs aren't a drop-in part. And then I think the thing that really happened was that Class D amplifiers came along, digital amplifiers which process the audio signal in an entirely different and clever way. And digital amplifiers offer a lot of advantages. They um, are extremely lightweight, and they're inexpensive to manufacture, and they produce excellent performance. Now, we did have some issues with digital amplifiers in their output stage. The last final stage, where it goes from digital pulses to actual analog audio to drive the speakers. That portion of a digital amplifier is critical for sound quality. And it took us a while to really sort out how to do that well. So some of the early digital amplifiers might not be quite as good as some of the current ones, but the current digital amplifiers provide great audio quality for low cost and low weight and they're super efficient power-wise. There's just a lot to like. And so the digital amplifiers have pretty much eclipsed all of the other amplifier types. And so I think that's why we just don't see so many MOSFET amplifiers or Class AB amplifiers anymore, because they've just been eclipsed by digital amplifiers. And so that's a quick history as to why MOSFETs are so great, and if you see a MOSFET amplifier, is it worth pursuing? Well, it's 
most likely probably a pretty good amplifier. One minor issue is that old parts can be hard to find. And so, like I mentioned, that David Haffler 500 amplifier that was one of my first pieces of hi-fi gear that was a MOSFET amplifier. Great amplifier, but the power MOSFETs that were used in that unit are getting pretty difficult to get your hands on these days. They're out of production. And with electronic piece parts, oftentimes you can find reasonable substitutes with modern parts, but sometimes old parts are just hard to come by, and so it's hard to maintain old equipment if anything should happen to it. And so do consider that. If um, you see an old MOSFET amplifier and it's not working, some of those early MOSFETs may be hard to get your hands on, and so it might not be a project you want to jump into. Well, that was a little stroll down audio history. I, I hope you found it interesting. And if you like this kind of video, well, I appreciate that. I hope you choose to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks again for stopping by, and I hope to see you again soon.